Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Welcome to the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm John Zipper, the club's vice president of media and editorial, and Michelle's co-host. Now, thanks for joining us for today's important discussion of drug use in the LGBTQ community during the pandemic. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, the Commonwealth Club is a 118-year-old organization. We're nonprofit, nonpartisan, dedicated to the civil discussion of important issues of the day. Any views expressed are those of the speakers. The Commonwealth Club is producing hundreds of programs a year, even during the pandemic. So head over to commonwealthclub.org slash MMS for all upcoming programs, plus podcasts and videos from our past events. And if you're watching us live on YouTube, use the chat box to ask questions and we'll work them into our discussion later in the program. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Michelle Miao, the producer and host of The Michelle Miao Show and a member of the Commonwealth Club's Board of Governors. Good to see you again, Michelle. Thank you so much, John, and thank you to all of you for joining us for this in very this very important program. There was an article that was published earlier this summer by the local LGBTQ newspaper, the Bay Area Reporter, that addressed the rise in drug-related incidents in the LGBTQ community. The article shared some data from the Chief Medical Examiner's Office that I think we'll get into in this conversation, but basically it shared that there were certain zip codes, presumably to have high LGBTQIA plus residents and uh, showed an increase of overdose incidents. And so here to discuss this, this important matter is an esteemed panel of activists and advocates. Uh, Kristen Marshall, who's an associate director of San Francisco programs for the National Harm Reduction Coalition. Wayne Rafis, who's the manager of contingency management for Sixth Street Harm Reduction Center. Sister Roma, a member of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, entertainer, activist, and as we know, uh, the most photographed nun, mo most photographed nun in the entire world. <laughs> and Juniper Yoon, who's the an artist and the director of cultural affairs for the Transgender Cultural District in San Francisco. Welcome all, and thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. I think it would be great to start off uh, with each of you answering your why. Why are you doing the work? Why advocate for our community in this way? Why, why discuss the topic? Let's start with Sister Roma. Well, hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be here and thank everyone for tuning in because this, this uh, topic is so near and dear to my heart. And Michelle, you know that. And that's why you reached out to me. Uh, when I moved to San Francisco in 1985, I was fresh out of college. And I joined the sisters two years later in 1987, and I became quite a fixture in nightlife. And I discovered cocaine, and I was a big fan. And um, then I realized that you could do meth, and it was cheaper, and it lasted longer. And that really set me off on almost a 15-year trajectory of drug use. I, Even though I remained a sister, which I, I believe actually saved my life because I was able to look outside myself and still continue my work in the community. So I always credit the sisters with saving my life because it's so easy to get consumed when you use crystal meth. It can very much become your number one best friend, your lover, your life. And um, I was a big fan of it for 15 years, but it started to take a toll on my health. And, and I started, I saw people around me who were suffering and struggling, and I continue to see that and now I've been off meth for longer than I was on it. I probably, it's about 17 years ago that I stopped. So I feel very blessed and very fortunate to have gotten out alive with all my teeth. And um, I just want to talk about this with everybody. Thank you so much for sharing. Kristen. Hi, everyone. It's such a pleasure to be here. Um, thank you for having me, Michelle. And, and also just, it's so nice to see my colleagues' faces. Um, I think for me, um, I've, I, yeah, I've been loved and cared for by people who use drugs my entire life. Um, I've also been loved and cared for by the queer community, of which 
I'm a part of. And um, there's a lot of intersections there. Um, and for me, uh, it was always the way drug use and people who use drugs were talked about in greater society, in mainstream society, in the media, in movies, all of these things didn't match who I knew. Um, so kind of like villainizing drug use and villainizing people who use drugs, people who sell drugs, um, people living in poverty. As someone from those communities, that just wasn't, <clears throat> it just wasn't my experience. And so for me, this work and the work that we do um, at the Dope Project to prevent overdoses in the community is um, based in love and care for the community that has loved and cared for me. And to say like, the stigma is one of the things that keeps us all silent. Um, and so is the judgment. And so for me, like my goal is to center the people most harmed by the war on drugs um, and to ensure that they, are have, they have constant access to the love and care and resources that they need and deserve. Juniper. Hi there, everyone. Um, yeah, I believe that this talk is really kind of striking a chord with me in particular. Um, I grew up in an environment where uh, people around me um, in every facet of my life were kind of touched by the use and misuse of drugs, of pharmaceuticals, of both illicit and licit um, sort of medicines. So um, something that is like kind of near and dear to me is kind of creating a humanizing um, perspective as Kristen had stated of these people who I have loved and have loved me. And, you know, I think that particularly when it comes to drug usage and community, it is something that can both kind of live in the world that is both beautiful and devastating. And I want to be a voice and also someone who can kind of carry that with grace and balance and have people understand that um, it is intrinsically part of being human to seek out uh, medicine and what is medicine if not poison with intention. So I think that people frequently seek towards uh, drugs and these sorts of things towards kind of just addressing trauma and at the district, the transgender district, uh, we do a lot of upliftment work, empowerment work, particularly with uh, communities who have been largely disenfranchised and oppressed for decades, for eons. So um, with a community that is so touched by trauma, I want to create a better understanding and more holistic approach towards um, kind of their treatment and the way that they are seen. And Wayne. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. Um, I agree with all the panelists. This is a really super important conversation to have. Um, it's really interesting. Why do I do this work? I started this work in 1997 in SoCal, um, right as the HIV AIDS pandemic was just decimating Black and African men in San Diego. Um, so I really started this work to enhance the well-being of LGBT people, um, particularly working with folks who are the most marginalized and oppressed in our society, and folks who are living in poverty. Um, I feel really, really passionate about um, providing compassionate, non-judgmental, non-coercive substance use services in our community. Because I think a lot of folks in our community, as Jennifer was saying, Sister Roman and Christian were saying, are impacted by the discrimination that they face in our society. Um, and so we see more substance use, we see more um, healthcare issues. Um, and I'm a member of this community and it's just really super important to me um, that we provide these services. Yeah. Thank you all. So in my introduction, I did mention, you know, an article that suggested uh, that the data that they have received that there is an alarming uh, uptick of drug overdose incidents in the LGBTQIA plus community. Would love to hear from you, um, speakers here on the panel, and if you if you're experiencing that, and is this data is this data right? Let's start with Sister Roma. 
Well, Michelle, I remembered that same article, reading it in the BAR, so I went back to it to glean the actual information, and the chief medical examiner released data showing overdose death patterns in San Francisco for the first five months of this year, and the data shows that through May 31, there were 299 accidental deaths due to overdose in San Francisco compared to 250 at the same point in 2020. And I thought 2020 was supposed to be the year that really, you know, <laughs> took, its, took its toll on us. And here we are in 2021 and it's up. And according to the report, that includes five deaths in the 94114 zip code, which of course includes the Castro and compared to one in 2020. And it, the 94103 zip code, which is our Selma, which is heavily LGBTQ area, saw an increase from 43 in 2020 to 60 in 2021. So it's real, it's scary, and it's such a slippery slope. I, it really worries me that these people didn't, weren't trying to die, you know, and I, I never did drugs with any intention or purpose of, of trying to harm myself or out of any kind of sorrow or depression. To me, it was just a, another way to add to the celebration and the party. And like Kristen said, the people that I knew were not the people that are, that other people have a perception of the drug dealers and the people who use drugs, people were friends of mine. And it, it concerns me to know that so many of my friends are still struggling and, and skiing that slippery slope that can lead to an accidental death. Um, I would love to add to uh, a little bit of nuance into that data. Um, so the DOPE project is San Francisco's overdose prevention and community-based naloxone or Narcan distribution program. Um, we're the largest single city uh, naloxone distribution program in the country. Um, and the nuance, like the piece of that data that is really, really important to consider is that the vast majority of our accidental overdose deaths are happening to people who exist at the intersections of all of the marginalizations that do exist in our community. And what is really the the, com the commonality between everyone who's passed away is that there was some kind of lack of access to resource. And so the way we kind of talk about overdose risk is not just you're using a drug. If this was just about engaging with fentanyl, we would be seeing people like seeing our death numbers in the like tens of thousands. Um, you can use that drug safely with the right resources. And so what actually drives overdose risk in our city is a lack of access to those resources. And so the vast majority of the people passing away are um, experiencing extreme poverty, they're experiencing homelessness. Um, most of the people who pass away, pass away in an SRO hotel um, or just outside of it. Um, and, you know, this isn't kind of a, a crisis without a solution. Um, most people who are at high risk for overdose in San Francisco also carry Narcan. Um, and sister, you, you had noted that those, that number is really high. It's really devastating um, to see those numbers. We know a lot of those people. Um, and this time, uh, last, last week, um, we, got a, we got a number and it was um, 5,500 community reversals have already been performed this year. So that's five, thousand five hundred times that someone who uses drugs or someone who loves someone who uses drugs use Narcan to bring someone back from an overdose. And so this is also my reminder that overdose deaths are preventable um, and that community is overdose prevention because in order to have your, revert, your overdose reversed, it has to be witnessed. And so the isolation of last year, the isolation that so many of our people and people in our communities face, being excluded from systems of care, um, when race, gender identity, um, you know, generational trauma, homelessness, all of those things are stacked on top of drug use, that is what puts people at high risk. Um, and so just to name that without people who use drugs and people living, as people experiencing homelessness in the city, um, our death numbers would be in the thousands. Juniper Wayne, would you like to add? 
Um, yeah, from the clinical and a social work perspective, um, we've definitely seen more clients um, calling in for emergency type mental health and substance use services in our Stonewall project. We've seen more clients wanting to access virtual groups to get support to minimize the isolation that they're experiencing at the Sixth Street Harm Reduction Center um, and the Contingency Management Program that I work in and our psychosocial assessments. Many of our clients, I would say about 75% of our clients are saying that fentanyl plays a role in their lives. Um, and it's very concerning. Um, a lot of times our clients are looking either to get cocaine or methamphetamine or some form of stimulant um, and unintentionally are ingesting fentanyl. Um, so we're doing what we can on our part to really educate people like Chris and saying as a community response that this is Narcan, this is how you can reverse an overdose. Um, there are test strips where you can test your substance so you can know what you're putting in your body. But this is definitely a concern. Um, and I'm excited that we're having this conversation to get more information out in the community. And as, as a representative from the sisters, I want to add that the sisters have always been very focused on harm reduction and we're a huge supporter of the DOPE program. And most of us carry Narcam as well. So, and I'm very proud of that. Yes, um, if I wanted to add another kind of layer that we need to kind of look at in particular to the pandemic's effect, particular to the lockdown and to the idea of like um, increase in drug use and why that also, while there is maybe an increase in drug use, why that has to kind of end with a increase also in overdoses, whether that ends in an overdose death or one that is reversed is, um, particular in the LGBTQ community, um, whether in the past or now, I would love to just kind of make a statement that nightlife is where there is a lot of freedom for the queer and trans community to find solace and family and a place where they can safely use drugs and be witnessed and seen um, and to have uh, people around them to see them in maybe their moments that they are the lowest and need the most help. Um, I think there was, particular with the pandemic, um, so many different layers of messaging, particular to folks with access and without access of sheltering in place. Um, and for folks who are deeply marginalized, whether along the lines of race, class, uh, gender identity, um, ability, we see that there is this push for them to isolate. Um, on a grand scale in society to say like, you should stay inside, you cannot be outside. Um, but when you are still dealing with the psychic traumas that live in your, you and your community, um, that's not going to stop you from using. That's not going to stop you from wanting to kind of find that euphoria that you find often in nightlife. Um, what you're taking out as a factor is first of all, the people that surround you in that community who can keep you safe. And then secondarily, it's also um, the stigma of kind of being seen out and about and still doing these things during a pandemic. Um, if someone were to say like, oh, I need help, I'm struggling, I'm using drugs and still seeking these things. And you're supposed to be staying inside and being safe and focusing on your health. Um, there's not that want to cry for help. So we have this kind of triple effect of not only this lack of access to healthcare and resources, but the lack of community to keep each other safe. And also this kind of moral dilemma internally of whether or not you can be open without judgment um, in a community that so frequently does not want to judge you. So I, I saw that kind of in a more kind of witnessing aspect within social media where people were asking like, why are people going out still during this like global um, tragedy? Um, but we are in a global tragedy and people are seeking, um, they are seeking happiness and a quick way to getting euphoria is through drug use or at least relief. Thank you so much for sharing all those thoughts and I'm, I'm right there with you and especially your last comments, um, Juniper. So you uh, had mentioned fentanyl, a few of you have, or all of you have, I mean, what is fentanyl? How is it, you know, what drugs is it in? How do you know, where is it coming from? And 
isn't involved in these uh, upticks of, you know, accidental overdose cases, we're, we're just hearing more and more about this thing called fentanyl. Sister Roma? I 100% defer to Kristen. I feel like she is the one to ask. So please take it away. Um, so fentanyl is not a new drug. Um, it is a, um, it's a synthetic opiate. Um, so it is made by us. We make it in a lab. Um, it's actually commonly used for anesthesia. Um, if you've had surgery and you've been put under, they have most likely um, put you under with fentanyl, um, liquid fentanyl, um, perfectly measured, perfectly regulated, um, was created in a pharmaceutical lab where it had to go through tons of regulations. And it's administered to you by an anesthesiologist who is an expert in that administration. Um, and how fentanyl, like any opioid works, is it engages with the opioid receptors in your brain and you feel the effect. The effect is a sedation, so it slows your breathing down, which is what eventually puts you to sleep. Also what puts you at risk for overdose if your receptors are overwhelmed by the fentanyl or by any opiate. That's all an overdose is, is your body being being overwhelmed by the drug. And in the case of an opioid, and in this case, fentanyl, your receptors get overwhelmed, your breathing slows down to the point where you're not getting enough oxygen or your breathing completely stops. Um, and so that's how it's impacting around overdose. But as a medicine, um, it's a pain reliever. Um, it slows your body down, it sedates you, it relaxes you, it creates distance between you and your pain. It simulates other hormonal responses around like safety, warmth, love, all drug, like this is always my pitch is like all any drug does is like mimic a thing that your body already does and maybe amplifies it. So you feel it more, right? So the first time any of us got a hit of naturally occurring opioids was the first time we were held by our, like our parents or our guardians, our mother. Um, and so that is what opioids simulate. Um, and our communities are in a lot of pain all the time. Our communities experience a lot of trauma. Um, they do not have access to adequate health care or what I would consider dignified and sound health care. Um, they are more marginalized. Um, they're more excluded. And with that comes a, a, a want to relieve pain. And that is what opioids um, provide. What is happening on our streets is a different type of fentanyl. It is referred to as illicitly manufactured fentanyl. This means that it's in a powder or rock form. It is unregulated. It is criminalized. You never know what's in it. You never know what's in any of your drugs. Um, I don't care how much you paid for it. I don't care who you got it from, um, unless you made it yourself. Um, with ingredients that you made yourself, you have no idea what's in it. Um, so there should always be a level of caution when you're engaging in any drug. Um, and because fentanyl is a white powder and a white rock, it looks like other white powders and rock drugs. And so what I can tell you based on all of the evidence that we have, all of the data, and this is drug checking projects that we've done. This is on the street interviews with people. This is from us, uh, my team and I, we are all drug users ourselves. Um, there is no widespread, there's no evidence of widespread contamination of fentanyl in other drug supplies. Um, that's not happening a lot, if any. What is happening is that people are unfamiliar with drug supplies, unfamiliar with their sources, and their sources are also existing in chaotic environments um, that are hyper-criminalized and mistakes happen. Um, you can't tell what drug looks like what unless you're testing it. And even then you don't get a false picture of what is in that drug. And so one, most people who pass away from fentanyl overdoses in San Francisco knew they were using fentanyl and were regular fentanyl users. So the vast majority of people were, were regularly using fentanyl. Most of those folks shifted from heroin. Um, that's about accessibility and what they can afford. Um, and then there have been many cases where people have thought they were using one drug, um, but it just, it was just fentanyl, or there was some kind of cross-contamination that happened in the transaction. And so fentanyl to know, uh, like works like any other opioid, it's just very strong. 
So the margin of error around using it is much smaller. It's a much more challenging drug to use safely and it's an opiate. And so it will respond to Narcan. Um, it is not Narcan resistant. Narcan will work. And um, yeah, so that's, that's fentanyl kind of at a glance and how fentanyl is impacting San Francisco. Um, and all it does is amplify the root causes of overdose that have already existed. So the same people who have always been at risk for fatal overdose in San Francisco are still, the, it's still those same folks. Um, their just risk is higher and it's been amplified. Jennifer? Yeah, I would love to piggyback on that. I think that that set such a beautiful foundation for the understanding of fentanyl, but also the, the history behind opioids and why they exist. Like, um, I always like to say that, like, you can't replace a mother's love, but in the LGBTQ community, if you take away the factor of chosen family, of like, you know, of folks who can surround you, like, I mean, drugs are our next best choice. If they are mimicking that very chemical kind of bond that you feel when you're connected with someone, why wouldn't you want to do it? Um, and I think that we live in a world where frequently folks don't think about consequences, particularly because consequences are so frequently out of our hands. Um, when people are, you know, of a marginalized race, particularly the black and brown community, um, people who are undocumented, people who have always lived in which consequences did not match their actions. You stop thinking about consequences and you start thinking about what choices you can make that make you feel good. Um, I wanna talk a little bit, um, just because I think that there is a note that uh, Kristen made about the idea of like fentanyl and how we make it. Like as a society, it is made in a lab, it's a synthetic opioid. And this is not the first time that we have been using and creating um, opioids to act as medicine, but also illicitly. Um, I like to go back to um, Purdue Pharma in 1966, or sorry, 1996, um, mass produced Oxycontin, um, which was regularly uh, utilized by people as a uh, over the counter in some ways, or um, prescribed pain reliever that is again, at the end of the day, a, um, a, an opioid. And it was actually marketed as abuse resistant and it was seen as a safe and effective pain reliever. Um, and we saw where that got us now in 2021 as a medicine that is one of the largest abused kind of common pills that someone can get that also ends oftentimes with folks overdosing or abusing it or finding it in the wrong hands. And I think that talks about responsibility. Um, frequently when we see in a society uh, punitive measures, it's always on the individual. Um, it's always on the drug dealer. That's why we have images of drug dealers as being shady. Um, no, no shade, but like if you watch movies, they're always you know, darker skinned. They are shot in like dark environments because they are bad people. But again, mistakes happen. And when that ends up costing a life or causing you know, harm to people, why are we looking at that individual who is also suffering the consequences of a failure of society when we don't ever look at pharmaceutical companies or at like larger entities who bear a larger responsibility for being the larger producers of these drugs and also marketing them so that they can make a profit off of them. Um, I think it's one of those things where we often divide drug use away from the idea that it is, you know, largely informed by capitalism, it is a market. So um, it also, you know, we have to look at where those regulations fall into place, and why we immediately wish to blame both optically and, you know, socially drug dealers and drug users. And Wayne, you had mentioned test strips earlier, and uh, Kristen, you'd mentioned them as well. And so if you talk a little bit about that, how do you get the test strips? Are they free? Are they accessible? Um, and do they test for something like, uh, you know, fentanyl? If you you didn't want that in the drug that you were using, you want me to take it, Wayne? Yeah, if you can take it, and then I'll talk about Sixth Street a little bit. <laughs> okay. um, so, fentanyl test strips 
Um, so drug testing has, has been kind of like a, how I like to say this, we call it like clandestine, like street-based drug testing, which is basically where we take a bunch of forensic drug tests, which are basically the P tests that, um, either your parole officer makes you use to make sure you're clean. Or if you like me and your mom was like, you're on drugs. And then they get them from Walgreens and they make you pee in the cup, um, as a teenager, um, That is the technology we utilize. And we, like any good drug user, take the thing and adapt it for our own purposes, which is um, instead of testing our urine, we take a bit of the drug, um, add water to it and dip the stick, um, dip the test strip in the solution. And it'll tell you if that sample is positive or negative for the presence of, of whatever drug the test strip or test kit is used for. So that the fentanyl test strips are given out at all of our harm reduction programs, but again, they're limited, right? Um, They only tell you if the sample is positive or negative for the presence of the drug that you're testing um, and doesn't tell you how strong it is for some, for most of our folks without resources um, that the drug that they copped was the only thing that they could afford that week. And you can't really like, return a product if you're unsatisfied with it. Um, you don't get like a receipt for it. So they end up using it anyway. Um, and they're able to kind of measure their use based on the information that they have. So test strips are not really testing, like kind of equipment's not meant to be used just by itself. It's meant to be used in conjunction with all the other harm reduction strategies that when you use them consistently, as consistently as possible, Um, every time you use drugs, no matter what drug you're using, you can drastically reduce your risk for overdose or an adverse effect. Um, or at least you can safety plan around those things happening. Christian, thank you. That was beautiful. Um, I appreciate you saying that. I think it's really important too, like Christian was saying that when you're getting test strips, they are available at harm reduction centers, six street harm reduction center. Um, off the six and mission that you also employ harm reduction strategies. Um, Because like Kristen's saying, we don't have really detailed information about the substance. It's either it's in there or it's not. And so one of the things that we do is we really want people to be, to make informed decisions. Um, And at the Six Street Harm Reduction Center, there are folks down there who are trained and harm reduction strategies to really support people to minimize the risk associated with using fentanyl. So I would say pick up the strips, but also stop by and talk to one of the health educators about the substance, um, about your use. Um, We have a contingency management program where folks can come in, do a psychosocial assessment. Um, It's non-judgmental, non-coercive. Um, when we really try to meet people where they are to really educate them about um, what they're putting in a body and what the impacts can be. So a great segue to a question on harm reduction. And um, we'll start with Sister Roma. And, and I know, Sister, you are Roma. You'll probably be able to talk a lot about this from even like a peer-to-peer, you know, conversation. And I'll be honest, you know, putting this program together for me, it was feeling the pain from so many people that that I know, that I socialize with, who are my friends, who are my family members, chosen family members through the LGBTQIA plus community, and um, and feeling their pain of losing someone, losing someone that we love. And so when we talk about harm reduction, if it if 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 our friends are too afraid or, or don't want to go to a harm reduction, you know, center. Um, what can we do? What can we do as peers, as community members? How do we talk about this with our friends? Well, what I love about hearing what Wayne and Kristen said is it's it's non-judgmental, and you have to talk to people where they live. It's it's a realistic approach to the fact that people party or use drugs for so many different reasons. There's no way that I could get in your head and figure out what is your motivation is why you're, why you're doing what you're doing. And it's not my place to judge you because, you know, I, like I said, you know, been there. So it's very important to me to let people know that they're safe, 
that they can talk to me and that you're just concerned about their well-being. And you're, I've always told people, you know, it can't a doctor's order, a court order, nothing is going to get you off anything unless you are ready and you really want to. Because, you know, we, I'm sure that we all have people approach us and they say, like, oh, I admire your, in my case, because I've been actually sober for eight years, you know, they're like, I just admire that. And I'm really trying to cut down drinking or I'm trying to stop doing drugs. And do you have like, how did you do it? Because I, I just stopped. I'm very lucky to say that that I, I just quit using meth and didn't look back. And I quit drinking a few years later um, without any trouble. And I don't have a, a, a secret phrase or something I can give you or tell you, except that you just have to be ready. So I just want the community people, members in my community and, and around San Francisco and around the world to know that there are so many resources, non-judgmental, who will meet you where you live and help you with whatever you're struggling with. And in most cases, you have to get to the underlying cause. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um, and I would add to like, you know, so many, similarly, so many of my friends um, and loved ones and strangers, because they know what I do, or um, kind of are like, how do I do this? And I think the first thing I off one, I will say, like, thank you so much for trusting me with this. I know it's not easy. So really acknowledging what it takes for people to say the thing, um, because oftentimes, especially for folks who don't talk about it at all, that's the scariest biggest step that they've taken around it and so honoring that they trusted you with it and then at like being open and curious so I often ask like would you mind telling me like what you love about that drug like why not like a oh why would you do that but like why do you use it what do you get out of it what does it do for you um and it can it be replaced slowly but surely Um, with community help, with something that feels better for you? Um, And sometimes the answer is no. And then we're like, okay, how do we talk about this without the drug? Like, how do we, is there behavior that um, that you're like not appreciating about what's going on? Like, and so for me, I almost always end up taking the drug out of the conversation and asking the person, like, what do you want? Like, what, what kind of life do you want to live? What do you need? Um, most people don't use drugs just because of the sheer factor that they just love drugs. Um, people use drugs to fill in some kind of gap or something that's missing. Um, and that could be as benign as, um, to put a judgment on as benign as like, I want to have a good time tonight with my friends. Um, I want to relax after work. I want to be productive in the morning. So I drink a bunch of coffee, all of those things. And it can get And that it can be like that, or it can be like, I feel isolated, I feel lonely, I feel neglected, I'm traumatized, um, those kind of things. And so it's about getting to the root and and honoring that root, because that's a part of that person. Um, And I almost always never talk about the drugs during those conversations, um, because usually when people have their needs met, they don't really look to the drugs too much um, in ways that they did before. I totally that approach is so beautiful because I think it's one of those things also that I think internally like as a person I know just like how we have internal biases when it comes to class to race we actively have to unwrite what society has told us in particular to how we view drugs I think again like drugs are commonplace there's a way to decolonize the way you see drugs. I think we we talk about drugs particularly with legality and how legality informs how we believe in drugs. I think in California particularly, think about how people talked about weed back in the 80s. And now you can go down to any store and everyone's smoking, like your grandma's smoking. like, And it's one of those things where it became a joke, but in the end, why is your initial reaction going to be informed about the drug that you're going to be talking to this person about. If someone came to me and was like, I just really need to keep like quick coffee, listen to what they're saying, um, rather than kind of have the judgment of like, oh, like it's just coffee though. Versus like if someone came to me and was like, oh, I really just need to cut down on my meth intake. 
um, for me, it would be kind of one of those things that my initial judgment would be like, oh, like this is serious. I think if someone's coming to you to treat it with the gravity that they're approaching you with it, um, that there is that need for trust and disclosure with you that um, maybe not so much focus on the weight of that drug, whether it's inside your head or by society, but what outcomes that person wants, what type of future does that person want? And is that, is that substance causing them to not be able to reach that future? Um, I think oftentimes LGBTQ people and particularly uh, queer and trans people of color and black queer and trans people and brown tra queer and trans people, they all really have a hard time seeing themselves in a future in which they are happy. So maybe think about talking with them about a future that they can be happy and make them understand that is possible and it is real. Um, I'm gonna ditto what everyone said and also add, I think what everyone's saying is that we need to lead with love and compassion. Um, and remember that this is a human being that like Christian was saying, Sister Roman and Jennifer Stan may have some complex needs. Um, and when I talk to my friends about substance use, it's really about um, trying to understand them as human beings and trying to understand how this drug, like folks are saying, works in the context of their lives. Um, I think the more we move closer to people who are using substances, we can help them and be help and be supportive to them throughout a process and a journey. Because I think it really is about a journey. Um, and I love what Jennifer was saying. I talked to my clients about this. I try to I ask some questions about what do you want to do when you were a kid? What brings you passion? When you wake up in the morning, what will fill you with joy? Um, so those are the kind of ways um, that we can support our loved ones in our community through this, this situations, these situations that we find ourselves in. And I would Go ahead, just add real quick that um, as someone who loves people who use drugs, has been loved by people who use drugs, I've also been harmed by people who use drugs, right? Like, I don't want to ignore that reality that, that we... We're humans, we harm each other, we feel harm. Um, there's, I also think accountability as a process and setting boundaries is an act of love and compassion and that it's okay to talk about it. It's okay to say like, yo, when you use that drug, like you, bruh, like you can't be doing all that. Like, you know how many, like I, we got kicked out of the bar. Like, I don't, that's my bar. Like, what are you doing? You know, and, but also like, are you okay? And we got to talk about it. And I think that kind of love and compassion and honesty um, is really important um, and honors the humanity of everyone involved in a process. And would just encourage folks that like, if you've been harmed, like it's okay to set boundaries um, and to push past a little bit of that stigma that you might be holding that that person did it just because of the drug. Um, in all, and I'm sure everyone on here can kind of testify to that, that like in all my years, I don't know if I've ever known anybody to do it just because of a drug, like that, that something happened and the drug was the only reason. Um, it's usually like some pretty deep underlying stuff that deserves to be held too. Yeah, it could be a pretty good excuse. Couldn't it? <laughs> but um, I do also love what Wayne said about it being a journey. And for a lot of people, the journey can take you to a place where it really starts to affect your health. And when you sit down and talk to people about why they're using drugs and how it makes them feel and how they used to feel when they did it, how they feel now, what their, how their motivations have changed, it's important to consider that sometimes they reach a point where they actually, it comes to a matter of life and death. And you have to sit down and, and say to yourself, do I choose life or do I choose death? And if you choose death, you know, I, I, but please choose life. I want to cue John Zipper to come back and join us um, with our conversation here. He may have some, some questions for us. And um, welcome back, John. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, let me start with what might be a really easy question, but you also might each have a different uh, place you want to point people at. And that is, if someone does have a problem or they know someone who has a problem, What's one, and let's just stick with the web so that you know maybe they can do this research themselves or make the contact themselves. What's maybe the first place or one of the best places you would suggest they go and either reach out for help or get more information about what to do? Um, kind of a question for all of you, but 
Kristen, you were nodding your head, so why don't we start with you? Um, I know Wayne has a lot to offer because that's his realm. Um, I would add low barrier. Um, the San Francisco warm line is uh, a 24 hour phone line that is not necessarily a crisis phone line, um, like, like suicide hotlines, um, but more uh, a chance to connect with really compassionate, non judgmental mental health folks. Some are clinicians, some are peers um, to talk through anonymously some stuff that you're going through, whether you just need someone to listen or you need tangible resources. Um, they're excellent. Okay, Wayne. Uh, I think this is a great question. Um, the Stonewall Project, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, um, is a mental health and substance use program that works with gay, bi, and trans men to really understand the underlying and root causes of substance use in a harm reduction, non-judgmental way. At our Sixth Street Harm Reduction Center, folks can access services there, low barrier, low access. Um, it's come as you are. And if you're interested in additional programs and services, we have contingency management, um, our Prop for All program, our Positive Opportunity um, Reinforcement Project works with everyone in the community, um, regardless of age, race, sex, gender, everyone is welcome to access those services. They're available on Wednesdays and Fridays from 4 to 5.30. Um, we provide urine testing if folks want to test their urine, because sometimes folks have court mandates or sometimes their family members like, I need to see that you're not on the substance, like Chris Hume was saying. Um, we also have some services available at Strut, some prop services, contingency management services at Strut. So there's different access points in the community where folks can come in and get the support that they need. We realize how we talked a little bit about drug stigma. We realized how stigmatizing it is to first say I have an issue with substances and also to walk up to a program and into their doors. It's very stigmatizing. So all of our service, services, like I said, are low access, low barrier. We use harm reduction, non-coercive, non-judgmental. We're not going to ask you to stop using drugs in order to get support. We're going to work with you where you are. Um, to get you the services that you need. And for some people, maybe telecare and telemedicine, um, it's much more of a way that they want to go. You don't have to go anywhere. You click on a link. We do have virtual services available in the community for folks who want to get counseling, for folks who want to get support. Um, yeah, I would, I would start there. For other folks, if you want to um, dial 311, um, they'll give you a list of services in the community. There are detox beds in the community um, through Health Right 360. So there are a lot of different access points in the community where folks can come in and get um, substance use services. And substance use and mental health services. Yeah, and, and before I go on to Juniper, 311, is that available in every community? So our viewers who are in other cities would have that as well, or is that just a San Francisco or Bay Area thing? It will direct you to resources based on your area code. Like if I call from a 510, it's going to give me the resources in the East Bay. If you call from a 415, it'll give you resources in San Francisco. Thank you. Mm. Alameda County is 211. Okay, great. Thanks. Juniper, your thoughts? I don't want to sound like a broken record. I totally agree with everything that Kristen and Wayne has, they have shared. But I think something that is like, maybe since we're on a virtual event, you know, viewers from across the nation and across the world are watching. Um, I think one thing I turn towards people, particularly folks who are trying to, you know, provide support for someone is to also educate themselves. I would not go and Google the drug <laughs> and like Google like programs because I think that uh, there are a lot of programs that have a lot of misinformation and that will scare you um, about how to kind of maybe not do the best behaviors to truly help your friend, your family member. Um, I just remember one of the first times when I was young Googling, just being like, oh, like, what do I do if so-and-so in my family is on XYZ? And it was just like, I think it was like a 
like a Christian ministry or something. And it's just like, you really have to be mindful that sending them without any resource to the internet is not always going to be the best bet. Like when you try to look up symptoms on WebMD. Um, I think one thing is that I have used it for friends, for myself is to go to drugsdata.org. Um, it's a really wonderful resource and repertoire of like, you know, what I call a catalog of all the drugs that you could see that are being tested on a geolocation. So you can Google like San Francisco, see what drugs have been sold and tested um, in that location pictures of them, usually like even the percentages of what's inside of those drugs, um, just so you can cross and compare. And again, like Kristen said, no drug is safe. If you buy the drug from the street, no drug is safe, but it can provide you more context of what the market looks like in your area. It can also um, provide you services to go get your drugs tested. Um, I don't usually suggest it as a drug testing site because most people aren't willing to mail their drugs to a, a, a entity, but it is fully anonymous. If you do decide like, you got a baggie, you got a press pill, you need to make sure that you're keeping yourself safe. Um, you can mail it to them and they'll they'll get you back results. Um, I'm not sure on the timeline, but they do do testing. And Rama, your thoughts? Well, first of all, I'm going to refer anybody who comes to me to my fellow panelists because you all are fierce. I have been so impressed and grateful for your input and your, your contributions to this this it's really it's an epidemic. Um, I would also suggest the Trans Lifeline, which is a wonderful organization that I love very much that you can reach out to. And if they can't help you directly, they'll point you in the right direction. And I live downtown. So of course, Glide is in my backyard. And I always say if you if you ever are in trouble, if you ever need anything, go to Glide because they got you, baby. Okay, um, another question. And I'll start, I'll, we'll stick with you, Roma, and then we'll reach out for others for answers. But there's been a lot of talk today about safe use of drugs. What is your message to people who are highly susceptible to addiction? Is there a place for them in party or other public LGBT culture where drugs and alcohol are freely available and even celebrated? Is, um, is there a place where drugs are available and celebrated? Is there a place for people who are highly susceptible to addiction, either are you know, have, have gone through it and, and, and they're trying to avoid it or, or to them, it's some people for whom safe use is not an option. Um, and yet, and we, we've talked about this in this program already, obviously a lot of club culture, bar culture, uh, LGBT um, party culture is centered around drugs and alcohol and, and such. So is, is there a space for, for everyone in that or I'm, I guess the question is kind of like, or do they just need to stay away from that? Any thoughts on that? Well, that's <laughs> good luck, you know. Um, I, I would say if you really are looking for a community that's a strong, sober community, go to the Castro Country Club on 18th Street. In the Castro, it's a beautiful, beautiful community. It's a facility that you can volunteer, you can provide service, you can go to meetings, you can meet fellow people who are experiencing some of the same things that you're going through, and it's it's it'll be there for you at all times. Any other thoughts? Anyone else? I would add that, you know, I think as a, I also work in nightlife um, and love nightlife, um, and I would add that I think queer nightlife tends to be some of the most visible queer communities. Um, I think we can often be people I would consider like often we are the loudest. We're like just always out and about and drugs and alcohol are such a interwoven part of that culture. And I don't always think that everyone's using it um, as someone who works in a queer bar. Um, not everyone there is drinking when they're there. Um, not everyone there is utilizing drugs when they're there. I think a lot of bars, I think especially queer bars tend to have like, um, like mocktail options and stuff like that. So it really, for me, like I, there's a lot of kind of push and pull. Like we talk about safe use, we enable drug use. I, that word is a judgment. Um, you know, we're just like offering evidence-based information in harm reduction, um, and then there's kind of the like, well, I can't be around drug use. And I would say that you are certainly not alone. Um, your community is there and they are some of the most welcoming folks I've ever met. Um, I often think they're just in the space. They're in the same spaces. Um, so I would encourage folks that are looking for 
um, kind of abstinence only approaches to drugs because abstinence only is part of harm reduction um, to really figure out what that means for you and what you need because um, often it's more than just like a sober space what you're asking for is community and to be held in that community um, and I can tell you that if someone judges you for those decisions you're making around your body it's the exact same judgment um, that I was talking about earlier around drug use so you also deserve to be held in that nightlife space um, and to figure out what you need from it um, even if people are using around you. Great. Uh, Wayne? Um, I love what Christian just said and what Sister Roma said. I would encourage people to find community engagement programs. I think part of the process is that we're asking people to change their behavior regarding their substance use, and they have to replace that with something. And like Christian and Sister Roma were saying, a lot of times folks are looking for community. Um, and I would encourage people like there's Trans Life, there's Black Brothers Esteem, um, we have Latinx programs, the San Francisco AIDS Foundation. I would just encourage people to do a little bit of research um, because these programs have opportunities just like book clubs and game nights and there's outings and there's retreats that folks can go to. Um, so I would encourage people to look at those community engagement programs. Um, San Francisco AIDS Foundation, San Francisco Community Health Centers, um, San Francisco LGBT Community Center. I would encourage people to do a little bit of research because there are programs and services that they can access. And then there's this periodical that's released called Broke But Not Bored, where there's a list of free things that folks can do in the community. There's theaters and baseball games and outings that folks can go on um, to build community and meet like-minded individuals. Um, so I would encourage people to do that. Juniper, do you have anything to add? Um, I think that everyone's kind of covered a really cohesive list of resources. Um, I guess one thing that if I were to say to someone who, you know, I think particularly with the LGBTQ and queer or the queer community in general, there is this idea that there's like a FOMO, like a fear of missing out that like, you know, you want to be at the bar because it's this big queer event and there's drag queens and there's all the people that you all wanted to know all week, um, you know, just all gathered up. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I would sit with yourself and really think about your own limitations and just understand that, um, that there will be pressures in those spaces and that um, with the long and kind of varied and complex history of our community, and its relationship to like drug usage. Um, I, I do encourage that first and foremost, make sure you're building a community also to um, help you with that accountability. Um, I think accountability of course always starts like with your individual self, but um, just know that I, myself, like if I went out and told my friends like you make sure that I do not touch the bottle tonight, they would, they would hold me. And I think that um, the first step is to really build that community, maybe in spaces that um, you were, we spoke about earlier that Wayne and Kristen and um, Sister Roma spoke to, um, and then knowing that that community can hold you to um, a better standard. Um, and recovery is not linear. And, you know, I think that we so often trick ourselves into the thinking that addiction is a hard stop that once we're done, I think, that's not true. Like people will, you will face addiction for most of your life. So I think um, just building that, that safety net will always just help you no matter what point in your life you're at or whatever part of your journey you're in. Thank you. And one of you did mention the Castro Country Club. And one of our viewers uh, noted in the chat that in fact, they'll be volunteering today from 2.30 to 6 p.m. at the Castro Country Club. So little shout out to them. Oh, one last question before I throw this back to Michelle, and that is, um, are there differences in generations, or um, I don't, I'm assuming there are, but the question is kind of, are there differences in generations between not just the, the, the drug use that, and, and that, you know, of particulars that they might be using, but of their willingness to reach out, you know, to reach out, Wayne, to your organization, or Kristen, in, in, in the way you would communicate with someone who's 18 or compared to someone who's 70 or something like that. So any thoughts on age differences here that should be, can, can be taken into account? I think it, uh, I don't know, 
know, Wayne, what do you, what do you think about age difference? I, my always answer in, in terms of any of it is like, it depends on the person, no matter what, uh, and what they're looking for and what they need and how they're going to want to engage around it. Um, but I do think what matters most is that there are resources where people are working them or at them or providing them and they mirror the communities that they're serving, right? So like for me, like as a queer cis white woman, um, there might be a lot of reasons why I wouldn't be someone's first choice um, in, in, in talking to and I recognize that. And so wanting to make sure that like, for instance, my team is not just a bunch of queer cis white people, um, making sure that it is diverse along experiences, age, race, um, country of origin, like all that kind of stuff. And so um, that way we're representing everyone in our city. Um, and so everyone can feel like they talk because don't ever let anybody tell you that drug use is one type of person's problem. Everybody uses drugs, every single person. So it just depends. I totally agree with Kristen. I think it's super important. It depends on the person, the context in their lives. The most important thing we can do is have a diverse staff and have diverse programs. Um, so if you're a young adult and you want to be around young adults, there should be a program where you can access those services and talk to your peer and get support. Um, yeah. Okay, any last thoughts, Juniper or, or Roma? I actually have one very last question. Yeah. Uh, you all have mentioned Narcan at the very beginning of the program, the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence carry Narcan. Narcan can um, reverse you know, overdose in some cases. So very quickly, Kristen, I'm gonna to toss to you for this answer. Uh, I think the DOPE project mentioned, you know, maybe one of the, the ways in which we can prevent accidental overdose is to make sure you're using with someone. It could be someone that you trust, be a friend. Maybe that friend can, you know, know how to use Narcan. So tell us where can we learn more about Narcan and, and, and also learn more about, you know, using it with someone or preventing accidental overdoses? Sure. Um, I would say no matter where you are, there are people who use drugs that are working in harm reduction and serving their communities, whether they're fully funded by, for instance, SF Department of Public Health, like we are, or they're underground and like distributing um, expired and stolen Narcan out of the trunk of someone's like car in rural Western Oklahoma. Um, so they're there to try to find them. If you can find them, that means they wanna be found and that means they're open to, to, to having your back and making sure you have what you need. I would say for folks who are more resourced, um, there's this beautiful program, it's called Next Distro, N-E-X-T Distro. Um, that's the website, you just type it into Google and they will mail you Narcan no matter where you are. Um, they will also provide, They in some jurisdictions, they can also provide other harm reduction uh, supplies and fentanyl test strips. And so it's very easy to access. Um, you just kind of got to know where to go, but I would always encourage folks to try to tap into their local harm reduction scene because um, that's where the magic's happening. Thank you all so much for all the work that you do. Thank you to all of you who've joined us today and joined the conversation. Uh, once again, our speakers today, if you'd like to get a hold of them or support the work that they do, we have Kristen Marshall, who's the Associate Director of San Francisco Programs for the National Harm Reduction Coalition and the DOPE Project, Wayne Rafis, Manager of Contingency Management, Sixth Street Harm Reduction Center, and also Wayne mentioned the Stonewall Project at the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, Sister Roma, a uh, member of the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence, and Juniper Yoon, who is the Director of Cultural Affairs at the Transgender District of San Francisco. Thank you to all of you for everything that you do. Back to you, John. Again, thank you to our guests and thanks to all of you for watching this program of the Michelle Miao Show at the Commonwealth Club of California. Uh, you can find more programs again at commonwealthclub.org slash MMS. We've got a full slate of programs coming up this fall, so we hope you'll join us. In the meantime, stay safe, have a good week, goodbye. <laughs>